All right, is this thing on? Yes? All right, that sounds normal to me. All right, so welcome to end-to-end -end monitoring for OpenStack Cloud. Um, we have four people today. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for coming, spending your last time before lunch with us, especially since there are, I don't know, probably about 50 other sessions going on right now that you could have chosen from. Um, so here today we have uh, Yichi Liu, uh, Phil Karinas, Josh Wilms, and I'm Chet Luther. Um, we are all developers at Xenos, um, and we make a product called Xenos Core, which is open source, and a version of it called Xenos Service Dynamics that is uh, for pay. So I'm going to start out today by just giving you a quick overview, hopefully no more than 10 minutes, on kind of what Xenos is to give you the context you need. And then we're going to dive into um, the OpenStack specifics, what we do for OpenStack monitoring. But the idea being that you kind of come away from this with um, a desire maybe to go and look at Xenos for OpenStack monitoring needs or maybe other monitoring needs, um, or just thinking about uh, monitoring OpenStack in general. It's kind of a, an interesting animal when it comes to monitoring because there are so many options and so many integrations. So let's see if I can make this thing work. Oh, it's very finicky, he was right. So what is Xenos? Um, it is monitoring software. Like I said, um, I could probably talk forever about monitoring software, but I'm gonna try and keep myself short. There we go, down. Um, so what makes Xenos different than most other monitoring software out there that might make you want to take a look at it? Um, it's unified, um, and I mean this in a couple different ways. Um, the first way is that it's unified um, sort of for all the stacks of your infrastructure, right? From the application down to the storage. Um, it's not an OpenStack specific monitoring solution. It's not a, a, an application specific monitoring solution and it's not just for monitoring hardware. The idea is to get all these things together into one place because they're better together um, because you use the whole stack at once. You don't just use a piece of it, right? Um, this is especially important, I think, with OpenStack because OpenStack is made up of so many pieces. If you only look at what OpenStack knows about itself, um, you're missing um, a big part of the story. Um, so when I say it's unified, I also mean it's muni uh, unified in that you have sort of these major monitoring concerns um, all together in one place. Um, what, what, you know, we have what we call the model, which I'll get into, um, events, metrics, and impact analysis. Um, quick point there, the asterisk next to impact analysis um, indicates this is a, a differentiator in the uh, commercial or the non-free you know, service dynamics offering. Um, we've tried to call out anything that's not in the free Xenos Core version with an asterisk throughout. If something doesn't have an asterisk on it, it's available in Xenos Core, and you can download it and start playing with it today. Um, so let's start with the model. Um, the model is essentially the sum of all the configuration and what Xenos has discovered about your environment using that configuration. Um, it starts kind of looking like this. Um, this is a screenshot of the app, and over here you have a list of the devices that are in the system. Um, these are what you add um, to the system to be monitored. They can be actual devices, like a server, um, but they can also be entire OpenStack endpoints. And this is mostly where your configuration of the system stops. If you dive into any of these devices, um, everything you're looking at here, this happens to be a Linux server, um, so you see things like um, network interfaces and file systems and processes. And all these things are discovered automatically and they're kept up to date automatically. So if you're the configuration of anything changes, the monitoring keeps up with it. Um, so events. Um, events, oops. Yeah. E events in Xenos are essentially anything that might be actionable information. Um, you know, as opposed to log management. This isn't just a fire hose of all the logs coming out of your system. These are events. These are supposed to be potentially actionable items. Um, great thing about Xenos is no matter where you're collecting the information from, be it OpenStack, be it Linux, be it a hardware platform, all the events came in, come into the same place, into the same event management system, and you get features like uh, correlation with our model, uh, deduplication, clearing, things like this. and uh, there's also a, a powerful system behind the scenes that you can sort of write arbitrary Python code to process these events, augment them, generate new events, do all those kinds of things that you might want to do. 
Um, and this is just another view. That last view was a view of all the events in the system, kind of the global event console of everything that's happening. This is just drilled into one particular um, spine node on a Cisco 8PIC deployment, and it's just showing the events that are relevant to that thing. Um, the next big section here is metrics. Um, probably know what those are. They go by many names, right? We call them data points, actually. Um, these are, you know, time series numerical data, the kind of thing you'd want to throw up on a, a plot on a chart like this, or the kind of thing that you might want to set a threshold against, right? So you get an event um, if you make an observation that falls outside of bounds or a thing like that. Um, finally, we have impact analysis. Um, uh, so, impact analysis is service monitoring, right? Everything before was sort of resource, infrastructure monitoring. Impact analysis introduces a, a concept called a service, right? One of the most overloaded terms possible. Um, but this is the configuration for a service. It's really boring looking, right? Um, but that's kind of the idea. Configuration should be boring and simple. Um, it shouldn't be really hard to do. So, this is an example of a service that has um, an OpenStack tenant. That's the only configuration that's been done. This OpenStack tenant uh, is in this service. And by doing that, what you get is if there's a service outage, or to determine that there is a service outage, uh, Zenith will go through and find all the dependencies, all the things that are related to that tenant through your whole infrastructure, not just OpenStack, um, and create on the top, we have these kind of meta service events. These aren't things that were measured from your environment. These were created because something your service depends on um, has an event. So when you look at one of these service events, down below you see all the symptomatic events or potential root cause events, um, and they are ranked um, according to our confidence that they might be the root cause. Um, so how does this work? Um, it's basically just a graph behind the scenes, right? So, you know, in the model understands what the dependencies are from the OpenStack tenant down to who knows whatever these things are, uh, you know, the APIC networking and things like that through your compute nodes. Um, so when there's a failure, it bubbles up this graph. It can be filtered out by any of these nodes. And if it reaches the top, you have a service problem. So this helps you answer questions like, um, I have a service outage. What could potentially the root cause be? Get you, fa get you back up faster, or maybe just back up to full redundancy faster. Um, and it, you can also look at it the other way around, where you can say, what, res or what services depend on this resource, right? What services depend on this control node right now? Uh, next major thing, Xenos is agentless. Um, the two stars don't mean it's twice as expensive. Um, they mean that Xenos uh, uses agents. Um, but there's no Xenos agent. We use the agents that already exist out there that are running on everything you're already running. So you don't uh, ask get install Xenos agent. You do things like authorize Xenos's SSH key, or um, set up SNMP, or provide Xenos the credentials um, to your Nova API and things like this. So, you know, out of the box, Xenos has support for a lot of protocols, APIs, um, and uses these to automatically discover and monitor things. Um, this is just how many I could fit on the slide and still have a reasonable font, but there are, uh, there are so many more than this. But if your, if your favorite important thing that really matters in your infrastructure isn't supported, uh, Xenos is very extensible. Um, you can add support. Uh, really, every part of the system can be extended, but very commonly the actual way to monitor new targets is extended. Um, so we, there's a, 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 you extend Xenos through this idea of a Zen pack. Um, there's a catalog for it out there at wiki.xenos.org. Um, you have all the Zen packs here by our user community and by us, um, kind of going down through there. A lot of these are just configuration, right? Just you configure your system, you save that configuration for how you want to monitor. Some of them are wrappers around Nagios plugins. You can use Nagios plugins out of the box. Um, others are more advanced and they use our Python framework for doing much more efficient polling, more efficient collection. Um, so in addition to being uh, extensible, it's programmable, uh, meaning you can use its API. So, you know, for example, our entire web interface is built on our API. So anything you can do in the web interface, which is everything, you can do through the API. If I'm interested in automating something, I usually just come into, your, into the developer tools and I see what call is the web interface making to do that, and I just do the same thing. 
Um, finally, it is, uh, it's very scalable. So we have, you know, we have users out there monitoring tens of thousands of servers, switches, routers, all that kind of stuff from a single Xenos instance, meaning you go to the same web interface to configure and look at all the data. Um, it is scalable because it runs inside of this uh, control center application. Control center is a Docker control plane for running distributed systems on pools of hosts. Um, it's also by Xenos. It's also open source. Um, so in control center, you deploy applications. An application is just a collection of services with interdependencies. You deploy those services to pools, which contain many hosts, and the services are spread across the host using a scheduler like they might be an open stack. And to process more or less data, you can just scale up the number of, or down the number of instances of these services that are running. Um, so that's the, the basics of Xenos. So hopefully you have enough context to understand what uh, Josh is gonna talk about. <laughs> there you go. All right, so thanks. it's down for next. All right. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so now we're going to talk a little about uh, how we actually did OpenStack with this. So we've built the Zen Pack uh, that uses the standard, <laughs> the standard OpenStack APIs to gather the inventory of all these different components. Um, you know, we've everything from tenants and other keystone concepts down to Nova concepts like instances, of course, flavors, images, um, Neutron networks, ports, routers, and then all the cinder concepts of volumes and all those. And so we, you know, we start pulling all these things down using the standard APIs, and we build a list. Yeah, great, big list of things. Not super useful, but you know, it, it's a beginning. <laughs> where it really gets interesting, though, I think is where we start to think about how these things relate to each other. And so we built kind of an object model in our system where we start off with really basic high-level concepts. You know, what is an OpenStack component? What kinds of components are there? Some of them are logical components, like a region. Some of them are software components, like a Nova uh, service or a Neutron agent. And using that sort of taxonomy, we continue to <laughs> extend this model out, adding concepts uh, specific to Nova. So this has, adds all those Nova things in, along with the relationships between them. You can see some of these things support nesting. Um, some of them don't. Some of them are one to many. Some are, you know, one to one. Um, and it gets even more complicated because now we start adding neutron into this, and then you you know you add cinder into this, and pretty soon you've got a pretty big model in in object model in Xenos to represent really a subset of of all the things going on inside of OpenStack. But it's the subset that we think is important to monitor and is operationally relevant that we can use to build interesting views. Um, <clears throat> so if you looked at just a little part of that, you can start to see some of the potential in that. You know, here we have an instance, and you can see the instance is related to a hypervisor, which of course also relates to all the instances running on it. You know, what image it is, what flavor it is, what tenant owns that instance. Um, relationships into the network stuff, so you, the relationship between the instance and the ports, and the, how the ports relate to networks and subnets and routers. And uh, this information you know, really starts to allow us to populate a model that really is very descriptive. So believe it or not, that's one instance, basically. Um, and even then, it's a little bit of a subset. Still too big, <laughs> hard to really see. Um, but good information, very useful information. Where I think Xenos really can add value is we start to take these big monster graphs and find interesting subgraphs within them. So this is a subgraph representing some of the more interesting relationships of an instance. So this particular instance is running on a specific you know, hypervisor. A hypervisor is on a specific physical host. It's got a particular image, flavor. You can see you know, the volume that's connected to it, what tenant owns it. A lot of information here that we can draw conclusions from that really come into play when we're doing those sort of service impact analysis questions as well as other sort of operationally. Uh, monitoring and, and event management. So in this example, how would we know what hosts uh, this instance uh, depends upon? Well, it turns out it depends on two, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but in this particular subgraph I've got here, the re this happens to include both the hypervisor as well as the uh, neutron agent that's providing DHCP for the subnet that this instance is connected to a network on. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's, it's useful information that might not have been 
popped into your head if you didn't have this complete uh, view of things. And so we use that to build user interfaces. So this is an example uh, where we're looking at a specific tenant. And now we can see, here's all the instances that this uh, tenant has. So that little sort of display dropdown lets you choose all the uh, related objects to the object you're looking at. So this is one way to kind of explore the model. And then if you're using the commercial version of the product, you get this dependency view, which is where we take the relationship information that we've already got, and we go further. And we say, well, which of those relationships actually imply a sort of dependency uh, that, are, that they already impact if you think about it the other direction? That if this thing goes down or is, is broken, it affects this other thing. That's another layer of intelligence on top of a, a basic relationship, which might be like a running on relationship. Well, is that a dependent relationship or not? Well, we went through and thought about all that. And so we've built this sort of dependency relationship model that can be used to build views like this. This uh, takes into account both direct and indirect dependencies. So you can see this actually shows those two hosts. We also have a visual way of showing this, something called the, the uh, dynamic view. And the way this view works is sort of breaking the, the model up into layers, going from side to side, and uh, showing all the components on that with lines sort of showing where the, where the impact relationships are. Um, but these views work not just for simple things, simple things like an instance, but also to any layer in this model. So this is showing it with a tenant. So we can say, here's all the, the hosts that this tenant has something going on on, that they might be impacted if that host went down. Um, you know, here's all their instances, but also you can do, apply this to anything. So you can say, all right, you know, if this particular neutron agent went down, what tenants would be affected? That, that's all available through this. Really interesting, useful uh, information there. You can also present that visually, but it starts to get pretty crowded pretty quick because you're talking about a lot of instances, a lot of processes. So I think that dependency view is that particularly useful one as well as the service view that we showed earlier. So there's another challenge to this. We've built this model. Great, we made lots of API calls, processed that information, stuffed it into another database. That's an ETL. It, it's out of date as soon as you put it in there. So keeping the model accurate is really, really important and, and really an area we spend a lot of time on in the case of OpenStack. So we have to keep the model in our database in sync in as close to real time as possible with what's going on in your OpenStack environment. Um, we do this by periodically doing a full model over again, which is certainly a starting point. This, you know, we make those, those OpenStack calls. We also make other OS level SSH commands and, other things that, are, that help to enrich that model. And that happens just you know, every few hours, we'll do this. But that's not enough. So what we also do is incremental modeling, where we consume notification events from Solometer that tell us when changes are going on. I mean, that includes state changes, it includes creating new objects, removing objects. So like if you create an instance, we'll get, we'll get an event that says, hey, new instance, here's its ID, here's its name, uh, what state it's in. It also includes things like live migrations. So if you're moving an instance from one place to another, we'll get an event that tells us, hey, it's going from here to here, and we'll update our model instantaneously, essentially. So we do this constantly. These are coming in on an ongoing basis. And that's how we try to stay in sync as much as possible. And of course, if, we, if we're wrong, if we drift away, the next full model will fix everything that, that might be out of sync. But normally, this will keep you, keep you accurate. So now we've got a model. It's hopefully accurate, hopefully staying up to date. Um, let's do some actual monitoring. That's supposed to be what CNS does, is monitoring, so. Um, so, start off with some simple things. You know, is the, are the APIs available? Can we pull them? Since we're constantly trying to talk to them anyway, this is a very easy thing for us to keep track of. So, so we raise an event if we have a problem talking to something. It's like, yeah, there's a problem. Uh, we also use those APIs to do the service availability uh, calls that already exist. You know, you can ask Nova if the services are running or not, and we'll use, use that. As well as, not necessarily that we don't trust that, but it's good to supplement that with actually looking and seeing what processes are running. So we, Xenos already has process monitoring capability, so it's going in there, it's running a PS basically, making sure command, the, the processes are running and keeping track of how much CPU and memory that they're using. Then there's a bunch of different metrics that we collect and build graphs out of, um, sort of overall counts of, of various resources. Um, you know, that's sort of a starting point. But then we also look at the uh, growth of those over time. You can kind of 
see them on a graph, see what's going on with your resource utilization, do a little bit of planning. And on a per instance level, we're doing basic, uh, um, LibVirt uh, is providing information about CPU usage and disk IO and network activity. On the host, since the hosts are just Linux boxes and Xenos knows how to monitor Linux boxes pretty well, we get all these other metrics. Now, I should mention those could also be applied to an instance. You just would have to point Xenos at that instance and let it log into it. And we would run all the various commands to you know, keep track of the load average usage over time and CPU and memory and IO, all sorts of disk things and the usual. <laughs> so I mentioned that we get a lot of data from Solometer, especially on the event side. And I thought I'd kind of go into a little bit about how we actually do that. Um, <clears throat> We um, decided early on when we first implemented this that we didn't want to depend upon the Solometer API or, or database because at that moment in time in particular, there were some performance concerns around if we were to sit there and poll it continuously, we were going to cause problems for some of our larger customers. So we opted instead to intercept the data uh, inside of Solometer. When it goes to write it to database through a dispatcher, we added our own additional dispatcher that also sends that data over to us. And that is applied both to meters as well as events. And we don't interfere with it in any way. You can still have a database. We just don't require you to have it. So if you want to, you can run just Solometer as a collector with no deba database and no API. And it still works from Xenos perspective. Um, you can also run a completely full normal um, deployment and that works great for us too. So basically, the way this works is, you know, Solometer Collector Process is pulling data off of AMQP. It's generating all of its events and meter values, and um, it sends them to us, and we send them across to our AMQP, and then inside of your Xenos cluster, we collect the data off of that process it and store it into our normal places. So, so extensibility is a big thing. Um, as Chet showed, there's quite a list of Zen packs that we already have, and some of those uh, are very relevant to OpenStack. Um, in particular, we've invested some time into more um, integrating, uh, sort of OpenStack enabling certain Zen packs where they are aware to some degree of OpenStack. And what this does is it allows us to draw the, draw the lines, to connect the lines between OpenStack concepts and sort of underlying concepts in these other Zen packs. So in particular, we have a, a sort of limited support from VMware and it's sort of a VIO type of deployment. Um, on the Nova side, but we focused more on the Neutron and, and Cinder integrations where we have um, support for Open vSwitch and APIC and NX, uh, VMware NSX, LVM and Ceph. And of course, some of these are commercial. Some of these will work with the free version. The way we approach integration is, first of all, to recognize that when you're building a Zen pack or when we have built Zen packs, they're built to represent the objects that are most operationally relevant about the particular technology you're looking at in the way that makes the most sense from that technology standpoint. And so the way that OpenStack uses, for example, Ceph in the way that Ceph actually is, they're not one-to-one. -one. It's a subset that's being chosen and used from the OpenStack perspective. And so the integration just has to be by saying this thing in OpenStack corresponds to this thing or these things in Ceph. It's kind of a loose integration. Um, and so, we, but we found that was fairly powerful by keeping, um, by, by thinking of it as, as just sort of a correspondence between this object and this object. We can start to build that up into more. So if we start with just correspondence, we say, okay, this volume has, now it has a little link in the UI that says, well, actually it's implemented. The Cinder implementation of this volume is this particular logical volume, you know, over here, or I'm sorry, this is, this is LVM in this case. The logical volume in LVM. But, so if we kind of think about these sort of integrations, so this is a Neutron example, each technology uses a different sort of subset of OpenStack concepts that map to a subset of its concepts. And as long as there's at least one in there somewhere, there's a connection between the two so that if something goes down, so Open vSwitch, for example, we integrate only on port. Both Neutron and Open vSwitch have a, a shared concept of a port. And so if a port goes down, and it doesn't have to be every port, it just has to be the ones that correspond. So if, if there's a port that goes down open vSwitch and it corresponds to a port in Neutron, that's great. That's all we need because now we can propagate that, that service impact through. In the case of APIC, it's a, there's a, happens to be also an idea of a tenant, so that's cool. Those map up, so we can use that when we're building those service diagrams. Likewise, you know, in NSX, they integrate in two point places. 
So this sort of loose coupling is really handy for us. Um, we, one of the things we've we found is if we don't have to change the OpenStack ZenPack to add support for a new one of these other technologies. It's generic. So we put the burden on the person writing the ZenPact for the other technology to integrate to OpenStack rather than vice versa. So we're not constantly having to upgrade the, uh, the OpenStack side of things. And also the domain expertise is sort of kept in one place. We don't need a complete map. We just need some sort of a, a subset. And as long as there's a touch point there, that's really what we need to do our impact analysis. So again, this is commercial only, but uh, this shows a little bit about how this actually works um, in practice. So this is a LVM example. And so you can see that at the bottom, and it might be a little hard to see, but uh, at the bottom we've got actual low level Linux device, block device, and it sort of rolls up through all the LVM concepts until it's a volume. And then it jumps over into OpenStack land and says, oh, well there's, there's a volume in OpenStack that corresponds to that one, what's attached to that, and, and continues on up and up, up to, to the top. Same thing for Ceph. Of course, in Ceph, it's a little more complicated. There's more moving parts. But the touch point is basically just at that volume level. And so all that other stuff at the bottom, the Ceph cluster part, that's already been done. That's already part of our Ceph's impact. And so now, just by making that small little bit of glue between the two, we can you know, draw a much more interesting picture. And of course, when you get to APIC, as you showed earlier, it's even deeper and even crazier. So, you know, I think this is hopefully that you can see there's some value there. This is really the, what we've been trying to accomplish is to, to take our knowledge that we already have in all these different technologies and pull it all back and relate it to the OpenStack technology. And so you can build this holistic view. So thanks. Any questions? How are we doing for time? No, we've got plenty of time. Can you go to the mic if you have a question? So is there any plan to um, start taking advantage of the new Solometer components or the new telemetry components like Naki and AODH? Yeah, it, it, we've looked at them a little bit. Um, we, we definitely would like to. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. Mostly we'd like to because the way that we currently do it is a pain to install because you have to put this extra component on your, on your box. So if we can get to the point where we don't have to do that anymore, we'd like to. So that's definitely something we're looking into and one of the things I wanted to learn a little more about at the summit. Yeah, so I had a question. So can you uh, talk about like two things? One is, you know, what kind of problems have you faced with, you know, using Xenos as monitoring? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, how did you come to the conclusion of using Xenos? Is that? Oh. Well, I, I work for them. So that's, <laughs> that's a simple part of, part of that one. But um, <laughs> the challenge we originally had when we first built this was really how do you apply those concepts to a virtualized environment like this? Um, in in, in, the, in the, the way that Xenos thinks about um, devices, there's this idea that it's a, there's this high level thing called a device that has components. And so when you apply it to something like VMware or like OpenStack, it's like, well, this is a very single device with lots of little components. And, but when you think about the fact that in the OpenStack world, uh, one of those components is something called a host and those hosts are themselves devices. We had a sort of a unique challenge and we actually had to build kind of a new way to think about that where we can have existing Linux monitoring going on on a Linux device related to a component on an OpenStack device. And, and bi-directionally, so that was a challenge. It was pretty interesting to solve. Yep. I can probably address the, the, the other part of the question. I was using Xenos before I, I came to work for Xena, so I was unbiased at the time. <laughs> um, I, I came from a world of using you know, Nagios plus whatever the graphing solution of the day was for Nagios, um, and pretty much nothing for events. So I just kind of got tired of you know, writing my own glue between all those things and having no good event management solution. So. I, I kind of had to cobble together a solution that was similar to Xenos, um, um, but I decided my efforts were probably better spent elsewhere and just use Xenos that was already cobbling this together for me. I actually had a similar experience. I, I was working on a similar product at another company and, and saw a Xenos demo, actually Chet was there, and it was like, uh, oh, this is really similar to what we were doing. So that was one of the reasons that I was, it attracted me. Uh, my question is about server discovery. So as you add another compute host or you add another Ceph node or something like that, how much is that kind of automatically discovered versus going in and configuring a host you know, through right. your product? And I guess the other side of that would be instances. If we did want to monitor instances, could mm -hmm. you say, 
hey, any instances in this particular tenant or all tenants mm -hmm. automatically get added to monitoring, something like that? Uh, I'll answer the second part first. Um, yes, that, that, that isn't supported right now, but we have done it before with other uh, virtualization uh, technologies, and so we're kind of thinking that's probably a general thing that we're going to do for, for, other, for this, this sort of use case. For discovering physical hosts, it tends to be trickier because a lot of times discovery is, is, is one of those things that works really well when you're talking about logical concepts. When you, when you get to a certain level, you don't always have a good system of truth for what is supposed to be where. Um, so we'll, we do what we can, and, and we'll definitely pick up new hypervisors and new hosts in OpenStack, but like on the Ceph side, it's, it's a little bit, it, it, it's not bad, but it's, it, the auto discovery stuff can be problematic. We've done, we've done a pretty good job in both technologies there, but there are other ones where it might be a manual step. It depends. Yeah. Uh, one more piece on that is, um, if, if, you, if you discover the Linux server and you ha let's say you already have OpenStack discovered, the, you know, all, with, all with the correlation, right, D regardless of which order you discover or add those in, the correlation is formed immediately once both are in the system. You don't have to configure that part. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a production operation standpoint, uh, you think about, uh, talk about services and a service that you're providing. So um, in monitoring, you can monitor all the different layers and all the data. And you can even correlate it, right? You're talking about discovery and the analytics piece, but what about synthetic transactions? So the idea of uh, actually synthesizing from your monitoring system a whole set of uh, op uh, activities that a typical, say, a subscriber would go through or something like that. No, you are. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, a lot of our monitoring really to other systems might be thought of as synthetic transactions. Because we're agentless, a lot of times the, the management API is the same as, let's say, the, t the tenant API. So, in, in a lot of cases, we are doing synthetic transactions because we're accessing it from the outside. We do have you know, Zen packs for synthetic web transactions where you can say, go here, fill out this form, click this button, make sure this appears on the next page, and blah, blah, blah. Um, kind of the same thing for SQL, you know, we can, you know, synthetic uh, SQL uh, statements and that kind of thing. Um, but just kind of generally, you're right, the synthetic transactions come down to the protocol. So as long as it's, you know, web, as long as it's HTTP, then you're covered. I have two questions. So uh, I think, I guess the Zenpack is prepackaged or you can download by yourself. And I wonder if we can, is it allow for us to uh, reprogram or uh, just like customize the package. And the second thing is, uh, I wonder if the uh, Xenos has the ability to scale out by itself. We need to uh, like define our own solution to scale the uh, monitoring servers. So um, I guess second part first there, the, the scale, like I, I just you know showed you a glimpse and I kind of said you turn the instances up and, and down. Um, just like the Xenos application, that control center is also fully programmable and has an API. So um, we don't have any sort of built-in auto scaling because we're not assuming that we have an elastic infrastructure underneath of us. Um, but you can certainly uh, dr drive through that API, adding new hosts to the pool and you know, turning up and down the number of instances of all of the services. Um, there's that. Um, in terms of um, adding to or extending the Zen packs that are already in the system, um, we do that a lot ourselves, and we use the same Zen pack, uh, you know, tools and APIs that you would. Um, so one Zen pack can depend on another. Um, certainly, like the OpenStack Zen pack depends on our Linux monitoring Zen pack. Um, so if you came along, you don't have to modify our Zen packs and then worry about incorporating upstream changes into yours. You just do a new Zen pack that depends upon the one you want to extend. Hi. Hey, um, when you initially started, you said like you know this can monitor like uh, across layers, like app, past layers, or infrastructure layers. Um, so, but um, um, the mostly it's it's you know um, the, the presentations focused on the infrastructure layer. So, like we can monitor the applications as well as the pass and the software is installed on the VMs. That's question number one. Uh, two is like uh, uh, how it uh, differs, uh, how it is uh, different from the Stackstorm, um, the you know the other monitoring solution that's in place, which also monitors across layers. Um, so I'm not really familiar with Stackstorm, so I won't be able to provide a good comparison with that. Um, but in terms of the layers, we focused on what Xenos focuses on. 
Um, you, you know, we had a, li a little time to do it, but Xenos is definitely focused on the infrastructure. The main reason I put app up there is a lot of apps are infrastructure. You know, like RabbitMQ, it's an app, but it's, it's infrastructure. Okay. So. Um, you, can, you can certainly do app monitoring, right? We have the web transactions, and a lot of our customers do custom application monitoring, but it's not uh, an easy thing to do out of the box. It's not something we do out of the box because you, it's a custom application. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to know a little bit about the architecture of how this works. Uh, is it more of a, like a central database and then you deploy collectors at each site and then it does like SNMP monitoring? Is that how it works? Uh, so the architecture is, um, there is a concept of a central system. Um, mm -hmm. That central system can be deployed on many hosts. On, it gets deployed onto a pool of hosts. Um, and we have a variety of databases for the different kind of data we have because we essentially have model data, metrics data, and events data. Those are the three big pieces of data we have. Um, our metrics, um, you might have even seen it as I brought up our application that was deployed in Control Center. Um, they go through OpenTSDB and they get stored on an HBase cluster. Our events all get stored in MySQL, indexed by Lucene, and that's all handled by the central pool. And then you deploy agents that are dumb agents that you can destroy and recreate at will um, to remote sites potentially to actually do the collection work and send the data back to the central databases. Gotcha. Now, if, let's say you know, we're in a virtualized environment and we have a bunch of VMs with guest OSs. How does uh, Xenos monitoring go as far as services or you know uh, packages, RPMs, you know, that stuff shows up on a guest OS, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, if I uh, configure SMP or whatever on the guest OS, it's, it still kind of sees as a physical entity when I monitor it, right? But if I'm using like a Zen pack for a, I don't know, for a VMware or OpenStack or something, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know to what extent it can see, you know, application level data. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. We don't, we don't make any assumptions that a server is physical or virtual, right? It certainly could be either one. Um, uh, it, it just comes down to what's available through the thing. You know, so like with a, a VMware, we can get a certain amount of data mm -hmm. from vSphere about a VM. It's not all the data that we could have gotten from monitoring the guest directly. The same thing goes for you know, Zen Server or any other of the virtualizations that we provide. So normally, what we like to do is if you are in control of the, the instance guests, right? They're not a tenants. Mm -hmm. Then I would say, yeah, monitor them too, and we'll draw the we'll draw the connections for you. So the if you have a VM guest operating system has some kind of a failure, um, that might be impacted by the VM as we know it from OpenStack. Gotcha. Is is this mostly read only monitoring, or do we also do read write? Yeah, it's read only monitoring. Read -only. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple so, of questions. Uh, just an extension. One, one second, please. Just an extension to the previous question we had. So when we talk about, about root cause analysis, so the kind of root cause which you guys are doing is more like dependency relationships. Uh, it's kind of a model the system. So what about systems which can't be modeled, which are external? So can't we write some policies which can tell me about the root cause if certain conditions or the events are met? We have a root cause. How do you actually achieve that? So um, our, our impact is, is definitely very much focused on discover, uh, discovery. Um, you know, we, uh, some of us had, had experience with older, you know, sort of BSM kind of tools where it's really rule heavy, you do a lot of configuration, and then all of your rules fall apart as the system evolves. So we try and stay away from con doing a lot of creation of rules for dependencies, but you can create these things called logical nodes and put them into your impact graph. To, to serve for those cases where we can't get a model of the system. So you create your logical nodes, which are essentially just event filters, saying if events occur matching this criteria from these systems, I'm gonna treat that as the state of this node, and this node fits into these services like this. Okay. So, so we still use dependency managed. You can just mm -hmm. create logical uh, nodes. So the impact analysis is more like a kind of a graph traversal which you guys do? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Okay, I see, yeah. thanks. Yes. So uh, are there any remediation capabilities inside that you can configure? Oh, yeah, actually, that was one thing I, was, I meant to go through, um, is in the event management, we have this concept of triggers, which are just um, event matchers, um, and then actions. So there, if you have events occur that match certain criteria, actions can be taken. 
um, out of the box as actions are like send an email, send a page. Um, there's a Zen pack to you know go to pager duty with it. You can execute commands. There's no specific re remediation, but there's definitely a call out where you could invoke remediation. Uh, remediation on the target clients. Yeah. Uh, is that possible? Uh, um, it would be it would be a function of what kind of remediation you wanted to do. Um, you know, some people have, you know, kind of used runbook automation, call out to mm -hmm. runbook automation systems to do the remedi remediation there. Okay. And um, the dashboard, uh, does it provide any policy-based capabilities uh, for operators? Uh, block these events from showing up or uh, those kind of, uh, that's what the condition-based, uh, uh, is that configurable? Yeah, that's, that's definitely configurable. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about the moving parts? So you talked about OpenTSDB. Is that something that we have to separately manage uh, as a part of? Uh, no, it's all it's all uh, it's all self-contained, and you just deploy the Xenos application, and it sets up your HBase cluster and all that. You don't even you don't know it's there until you go into the scenes and you see the service. Uh, so from a troubleshooting standpoint, um, uh, is it like if things get out of control? Like, uh, do we have like uh, troubleshooting steps and things that? Yeah, I mean, it is. It is still th those under the covers, and we have uh, sort of within our application we have centralized log management, so you can go to the central place to look at logs and that kind of stuff. Sure. All right. All right. We still have a few more zinnies up here. So yeah. Wants to. <laughs> the bunny. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I had a question: Is uh, since we uh, OpenStack has different versions and uh, may yeah. have different uh, objects or uh, uh, relationships, yes. so uh, can the current Dennis support all the uh, different OpenStack releases? So far, um, we've done. So far, <laughs> so far we've done well, but. Um, it, when we get into a situation where there's something contradictory, it, we, will, we will definitely do our best to, to resolve that. Um, generally, the way we try to try to, to do this is to, as soon as we can, test it with a new version and make sure that uh, we haven't had any surprises. But uh, that's our intent. We don't want to have a bunch of different versions of the Zen pack. We want to try to keep it. So, so far, so good. <laughs> yeah. All right, and for those of you who have stuck around this long, you get a prize for hanging out. Um, <laughs> we have uh, a happy hour Wednesday. Um, what does it start? Six o'clock at, at Handlebars. Um, you can come by, um, get a free drink. Thank you. Thanks.